So again, just to remind you, the uh, focus for the class is on the kingdom of heaven, or the, the, the kingdom of God. And this is the next two pages of the notes. We're we'll starting in chapter 3 of Matthew's Gospel. So we've done the uh, birth of Jesus. Now we're going to meet a uh, kind of famous fellow, John the Baptizer. When we talked about the kingdom of heaven, uh, Matthew's is the only gospel that uses the phrase of heaven. The others use the kingdom of God. And uh, one of the basic reasons is Matthew being written for a Jewish audience or partially Jewish audience is that to use the name of God, even to use the word God, um, would be considered um, wrong. Not quite blasphemy, um, but uh, Jewish leaders always, whenever they were even reading the Torah, they would substitute the word Yahweh, they would substitute Adonai for Yahweh, which is the Lord God. Um, so Matthew substitutes that sense of the kingdom of God with the kingdom of heaven. Uh, to avoid using any reference to the divine name. And uh, the other side of that is the actual word he uses, um, the Greek word is basilie, which, uh, you know, we, we translate it as kingdom. But kingdom, first of all, is not a kingdom in terms of territory. It's not a kingdom in, ter in terms of um, waiting for this kingdom of heaven that we usually think of. We think of the kingdom of God in the future. It's not about a future kingdom. It's not about a territorial place or a territorial kingdom. It refers to, the, the word actually refers to a rule or a reign. And, and by using that word, it's, it's less, um, one is it's less sexist because, of course, a kingdom is ruled by a king. I guess a queendom would be ruled by a queen or a principality by a prince. So it has it is less to do with the title and more to do with that sense of time of ruling or time of the ruling over people, so the reign of God, uh, which would be a more accurate, rather than kingdom of heaven, the reign of heaven. Uh, so that refers then to a period of time. That also makes it a little bit easier for us to understand that this is referring to something that is present to us, that is available to us. So when he says the reign of heaven is at hand, he's talking about it is now available to us. It doesn't mean that we are in it, or that you know the whole world has changed or the end of the world has come, but rather that we have the ability to be under God's reign. You know, which is, of course is that one song that we sing in the 1045 Mass, Our God Reigns. Um, so it's that sense of that the reign of God, the rule of God is present in our lives. It's available to us. It's open to us. So that time frame is, is not about a place and it's not about a future. It's about this reality, whether or not God rules, God reigns in our hearts. God reigns in our lives. God reigns in the world. And of course, this ties up then nicely with that sense of what we saw in the first two chapters 
the Son of God. Who is Jesus? He's the Son of God. And of course, if the Son of God has come to earth, the Son of God is incarnate, then the reign of God must also be on earth. The reign of God must also be present and incarnate in our world. Obviously, if you're talking about another kingdom or another reign, you are in opposition or you're in contrast to the imperial authority, to the Roman authority, to the Roman rule. So Matthew is very clear, and the other gospel writers do the same thing, that this kingdom of heaven, this reign of God, is in opposition to the Roman reign. Um, at this point, we would have been at the beginning of what was known historically as the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, or the great reign of Rome, which lasted 20 years. But that reign of Rome was built upon do domination, it was built upon exploitation, it was built upon subjugation. The reign of God is not built upon domination or exploitation. It is not built upon subjugating peoples. Which we'll see later on when we get to um, John the Baptist and, and why Jesus must be baptized, or, or rather, not John the Baptist, but rather when we get to the temptations, we'll see how that plays out in the temptations of Jesus. <coughs> well, yeah, last week we talked a little bit about the difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. These, um, uh, these groups are, are brought to life again here and, and kind of really introduced to us. And give you a little bit of background. Um, there are enlisted in the, in the Gospel of Matthew three religious groups, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. The Sadducees, uh, you know, we, we heard them last week about the, um, or two weeks ago about the resurrection, um, or last week about the resurrection and their belief in, in not or not unbelief in the resurrection. It's more than that. The Sadducees were actually part of the priestly class. But even as part of the priestly class, because the, the kingdom was, or the uh, land of Israel was controlled by the Romans, many of them were appointed by Romans. But they were part of this priestly class. They were considered the just ones, would be another way of saying it. Um, there are two possible translations, or two possible origins to this word. One is Zadok, are the sons of Zadok, which again, he was a priest, he was part of the Levitical tribe. And the other is the, to translate the, the word Sadokim, which is just ones. So they were the ones who were doing things justly, rightly, according to the law. And they had strict interpretation of Mosaic law, of the Torah. Pharisees, on the other hand, were a much more popular group. Now, we don't see them as popular because we learn about them through the gospel. And obviously the gospel <laughs> used them in opposition. But they, they were the ones who brought religion to the laity, to the masses. And remember, if the Sadducees are the priestly class, we talked last week about the, the Sadducees not being around after 70, after the destruction of the temple. Well, the priests were only needed in the temple. If there is no temple, then there's no need for the priests. So, at least in Jewish uh, practice. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were the rabbinic teachers. They're the ones who are, who are taking the, the Torah and the laws of Moses and interpreting them for people in an everyday life. But they were trying to keep it, again, in a strict interpretation, trying to, uh, as, as we see in the Gospel, trying to um, get people to understand that if they followed the laws, everything would be right. So if they did things the right way, then they would be okay with God. And so they had this um, strict sense of, do this and you will live type of thing. So it's not necessarily your heart or not necessarily your faith, but rather your action. If it's doing the right thing, if you're washing your hands the right way, if you're following the Sabbath laws correctly, then you are right with God. The scribes, um, so they, they, would, um, they would be rabbinic teachers. They would be people leading synagogues, teaching people about the law. The third group, the scribes, were... Basically, there were people who could read or write. So they, there were scribes who were Pharisees and scribes who were Sadducees. Uh, scribes were also judges. The three groups of people made up the Sanhedrin that we find out later in the um, crucifixion where Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin to be tried. Um, the three groups made up the Sanhedrin, the, the kind of Jewish tribunal, the Jewish court. But the, uh, the scribes were the ones who would read or write there were some who were Pharisees, some who were Sadducees, some were judges. Um, they, they acted in many different capacities, but they're called scribes because they had the ability to read or write. So now let's get to our, the first of our main characters here in the Gospel. 
uh, and that is Jan. Now, in Jan, we're going to find a couple of things, and in both of these things, I, I used the word at the top, I used the word kerygma, which is the proclamation. So both of them are proclaiming this kingdom of heaven. Uh, as, as we get into this, so we find in the beginning of chapter 3, in those days, John the baptizer appeared preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then when we see Jesus starting his preaching ministry, he's going to do the exact same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So both of them are, are, have this curriculum, this proclamation of the kingdom. Um, John, we see, is coming in the person, personage of Elijah. And Elijah the prophet, considered uh, theologically as, as the great prophet in Israel. Um, second only to Moses, as, as far as prophetic ability and um, power in the Spirit of God. Uh, you know, probably third in line after, or fourth in line after Moses, David, Abraham, Elijah. Those are, those are the big ones in terms of Jewish understanding or Jewish characters. Um, in coming to the, the uh, personage of, of, of Elijah, the other thing that happens, though, is is John, as, he, as he's beginning to speak to the people, he, he's set up as this person, of a, kind of a, as Elijah, but he's talking about the primacy of Jesus, that Jesus is greater. One coming is, is one who's coming after me is greater than I. I'm not worthy to stoop and, and um, untie his sandal strap. And um, one of the commentaries I was looking at on, on this, uh, I actually grew in my estimation for St. Polycarp, because one of my... Um, one of the stories I love about St. Polycarp, or one of the little bits of the story about St. Polycarp, is that people used to fight. Um, they used to, to vie with each other for the opportunity to untie his sandals. Um, and I always thought it was just simply because of great reverence for him and his advanced age, because he's probably like 92, and you know, probably couldn't do it himself, and people would be glad to do it for him because he was such a holy man. Um, in those days, servants did not untie their master's sandals. That was considered like the lowest thing you could do. So, you know, you, a servant would do everything for their master, including bathing their master, but they wouldn't to untie their sandal straps. Touching their master's feet was considered the ultimate form of humiliation. So, of course, John saying that I'm not even worthy to do that. I, I am so humble before him that I'm not even worthy to do what would be the most humiliating thing a servant could do. And of course it only made me think about Polycarp and if people were vying to untie his sandal straps, that that's how much they loved that saint, that's how much they thought of him. Much more than I, you know, just thought in terms of his age or his holiness, that was that was a great sign of respect because it was such a humiliating thing for, for someone to do. And they were willing to do it. So so John speaks about that in terms of the primacy of Jesus. How how Powerful is the one coming after him. So powerful that I wouldn't even be worthy to be humiliated by him. That's how powerful the one coming after me is. When John comes in and he talks about this uh, repent, it was, was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken. Matthew says, um, prophet Isaiah had spoken, and a voice of the one crying out in the desert, prepare the, uh, the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Actually, that prophecy, as Isaiah wrote it, refers to the return of Israel from exile. So remember, the Israelites were in exile in Babylon, and they would have to go through the desert, you know, to get from Babylon back to their homeland. And so that prophecy is actually referring back to the return of the Israelites from exile. But Matthew takes that prophecy and then says, There's, there is a greater exile that we did not know of, and that is this exile that we have had from God himself. And so the one coming after me making straight his paths is to prepare us to return from a much greater exile and of course crossing a desert which of course the desert has has great significance to the Jewish people remember it was it was when they left Egypt they had to go through the desert but they didn't take the the simple way along the coast they took the circuitous route along the um, Sinai Peninsula and spent 40 years kind of walking around in circles until they were ready to get into the promised land. So, that, and that's again about making the straight paths, because the Israelites did not take a straight path from Egypt to, to the promised land. They took a very circuitous path, and back and forth, and kept uh, backtracking themselves, because they weren't ready, they weren't able to get into the promised land yet. However, 
the one coming, is going, there's going to be a straight path for him. And they'll go straight from the desert through it and into the promised land. Third thing is, John was uh, baptizing at the Jordan River. Which, of course, from our point of view as well, it's, it's kind of the main river there. It would make sense. The Jordan River um, is more, more than makes sense. Uh, for those who like conspiracy theories, John picked the Jordan for a, a number of really good reasons. Okay? First of all, the Jewish people, in order to get into the Promised Land, the last thing they did is they crossed the Jordan River. So... Moses was able to lead them up to the Jordan, and then, of course, Joshua led them across the Jordan. And so the Jordan River is that, that change from exile into the Promised Land. Just, just by that alone, you know, John is, John is picking the place that needs to be done. He's out by the desert, and so he's reminding, he's reminding people. But the Jordan River is also, um, if you go back to, actually, not Elijah, but Elisha, when, when he cured a leper, uh, who was named the Syrian, he told him to bathe in the river of the Jordan. Which, of course, and, uh, Naaman's response was, are not the waters of Babylon, are not the waters of um, Nineveh better than the waters of, of uh, Israel? But his servant told him, you know, if he had told you to do something hard, you would have done that. Why don't you just go in the water? Um, so, of course, you know, John is at the Jordan River where, he, where people are coming to have their sins cleansed. Okay, to their leprosy, their, that thing that destroys them, is being cleansed away from them. And he's announcing an Elijah. Elisha was the, um, uh, was the um, student of Elijah. So he's announcing as Elijah that there's one... And of course, uh, if you look at the story of Elisha, he cured a leper, he raised a dead child, and he healed a blind man. And you look at the stories of Jesus, he cured a leper... Actually, cures ten in Luke's gospel. Cures a leper. He raises the dead child. Raises two of them in, in our gospel, and he heals a blind man. And actually, there's like four of them that he heals. So and, that we have recorded stories of. But and, and the, again, the idea is okay. The one coming after me, he does everything that the one coming after Elijah did. Um, but Elijah, the difference is Elijah chose his um, successor. John didn't choose his successor. Rather, John's successor um, was chosen by God. And of course, it was, in, it was at the Jordan River that Elijah went back up into heaven. Which, which again, for the Jewish people, they, they thought he was coming down again before the, the Messiah would come. Elijah would come first. So Elijah had to be the person to come first to announce, announce the Messiah. And if he went up at the Jordan, he was going to come back down at the Jordan. So John is... Baptizing at the Jordan is preaching at the Jordan because if he's pretending to be Elijah, or, like I said, conspiracy theories, if he's meant to be in the uh, image of Elijah, then he's going to be right there where Elijah was, so that when the one who comes after him, he will start this ministry again, crossing the Jordan and bringing back uh, the people into the promised land, but a different kind of promised land that would be the kingdom of heaven. Um, so, all that makes sense? No. Wrap it up? No? Okay. Why does Elijah go up to heaven with a chariot of fire? Right. That's Elijah. That's Elijah. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, but John's coming back as the reappearance of Elijah. The second. John got his head chopped off. He never went up to heaven. No, because this is the coming, this is the second coming of Elijah, not the, not the first. So, okay. Result for itch kind of kill straight in the middle. Probably, but not anymore. Nature of John's baptism. Now, um, baptism was not necessarily a, a, a new thing in and of itself, because Jewish people in their laws, they, they have these ritual purifications, these ritual baths. So to go into the river and to be purified, uh, mostly to be, to, to be made ready to celebrate whatever you're going to celebrate. So if you want to offer a sacrifice at the temple, you have to be purified. And one of the ways of being purified is to be washed also. That's part of it. So the sense of being washed, the sense of being purified, was part and parcel of, of Jewish custom. But, but John's not talking about a ritual purification to prepare yourself to celebrate, uh, make a sacrifice, or, or to celebrate a particular holiday. 
Because his baptism, his purification, is a one-time event for the repentance of sin. Amen. Which is an entirely different understanding. So this wasn't just simply to celebrate a holiday or make a sacrifice. This was to change your life. Um, now, in the Qumran community, which is a community of uh, ascetic uh, followers, or ascetic Jews, who were at that same time, uh, it was in, by the Dead Sea, living around the same time, they had a baptism also. But their bap and their baptism was for the repentance of sin, but it was an annual event. You know, it was that they presented themselves annually and, and celebrated this baptism to repent of their sin. So again, John's, John's was a one-time event. It was meant to be life-changing. The other thing is that you did not baptize yourself. You did not wash yourself such as you would for either the baptism of the Qumran community or for the ritual purification of the Jews. You had to be baptized by someone else, which means you had to submit yourself to that cleansing water, to that cleansing that someone else was uh, affecting for you. So that was, a, that was the other important difference there, is that it's not self-administered. And of course today nobody, nobody's allowed to baptize themselves, they must be baptized by someone else. Um, so then we, we finally we come to Jesus getting baptized, don't we? And Jesus getting baptized, um, there's a, a number of things going on here. And at this point, we are, where are we? Oh, but, well, before we get to Jesus a little bit, let's go back to some of the things. So, so John is baptizing in the Jordan River. Everybody's coming out there. So it says that everybody was gathering around. Um, the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. And of course, John's clothing is, is uh, like Elijah's clothing. So his, his fame is spreading, people are coming to him. Which of course, again, using the Jordan, John is drawing everybody to this one place, the place where, where Israel was born, where, where the promised land was entered into. And then of course, along with them are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They come. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, now, the difference there is if you go up a, a couple of lines, the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. The Pharisees and the Sadducees weren't coming to be baptized. They weren't being baptized. They were coming up to his baptism. They were checking him out. They were investigating the process. What is he doing? Where does it fit in the law? Where does it fit in the temple? Where does it fit in the sacrifice? So they were, they were not there. So when, when John attacks them, you brood of vipers, it's because they're there to investigate him. They're, they're not there to repent. And so he, he you know, comes up with a few strong lines here. You brood of vipers, which of course, um, vipers, a uh, significant number of times in the Bible, is, is used to represent Satan. And a brood of vipers, of course, would be the children of Satan. You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. So, he's still calling them to repentance. But they have to do something good. They have to produce something to show that they're repentant. And then he challenges them. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Now, when I got to that line, as I was looking at that, I, it, it dawned on me, it, it sounded like the line that I had heard when I was in Israel. There was um, our tour guide at the time, so a very nice lady, and you know we asked her if there was a particular form of Judaism that she practiced. She says, oh no, I'm Jewish by birth. And, and it's one of, the, one of the things that is, is a common thread in the culture is that because, and it's like people who say they're Catholic by birth, right? Uh, but there's, there's this common thread that because you are of the bloodline of Abraham, you are one of Abraham's children, therefore you share in his promise. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they must have been saying to him, well, we're the, we're the sons of Abraham. And of course, John is going to challenge them as to whether or not being a son of Abraham, being a, a Jew by birth, is good enough. 
or do they have to do something, or do they have to produce fruit in order to show that they truly are, are children of Abraham? So John challenges that, and, and of course, the, you know, he, he goes on to say, I tell you, God can raise up children for Abraham from these stones, which, which makes us think, okay, so he's going to challenge them and, and negate them, or negate their claim. The other side of that is also, remember that there were a couple of times during the Exodus that God was so angry with his people that he was going to wipe them all out and raise up new children for Abraham from Moses. They would still be called the sons of Abraham or the children of Abraham, but their only parentage would become through Moses. So, you know, John, John's remarks are not out of line biblically. That, that God himself was, was not willing to put up with children who were not going to listen to him. So it's not simply because I love your father Abraham, or because I love your father David, which of course the kingdom was taken away from David's uh, grandson, and split in two, and then ultimately destroyed. God, God will not hold on to simply because you have a bloodline. So we see that uh, regularly in the Bible where that happens, but we also see that claim regularly, you know, I am of this, so I'm a, I'm a child of Abraham, or I, I was born Catholic, or, you know, people, and, and we use it to excuse all kinds of bad things. <laughs> so, um, and then he goes on in, in the uh, line, and, and this, of course, echoes other lines that we hear in the Gospel. So he says, even now, the axe lies at the root of the trees. And of course, if the axe is at the root of the trees, it's not because you're going to trim the tree. <laughs> you know? And it's, it's not because you're going to kind of shorten it a little bit so it can grow stronger. No, you're, you're cutting it down. If it's, if it's at the root, you are going to uproot and destroy this tree. And therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Just like Jesus says later that, you know, the Father will prune those who bear good fruit, but those who bear... Uh, who did not bear fruit, he will cut away and throw into the fire. So this, this line comes back, being used by Jesus at another time. And then he goes on, I am baptizing with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. And then that's where he comes into the, who he is. And then he talks about him coming in with his winnowing fan in his hand, he will clear his threshing floor. Um, so that sense that the, the kingdom is happening and, and things are going to be decided. Just like at the harvest time, you bring the wheat to the, to the miller, and, and in those days, they would throw the wheat up and use the winnowing fan to kind of uh, separate the chaff from the, the grain of wheat. The grain would fall to the ground, the chaff would be kind of blown away as it was being fought at with a winnowing fan, and as it was blown off to the side, then that would be gathered up <coughs> and thrown into a fire while the grain itself would be milled. Actually, you kind of beat the stuff for so the seeds would come off the chaff. Okay. Well, that's what the winning fan is doing, actually. If the fan is not a fan, no, it's actually more like a the rake. The wind, the wind. Right, but the, the winnowing fan is actually a rake. It's more like a rake. It's called the winnowing fan, is the translation. But the, the object is more like a rake that is beating the, the seeds, the grain. Um, so at this point, then, after, after that encounter, then Jesus comes in. And it's only in Matthew's Gospel where Jesus and John speak to each other at the baptism. The other Gospels, they don't have Jesus and John speaking to each other. And, and of course, there's a couple of questions that come up here because of this conversation. Why does Jesus have to be baptized? It's a regular question that comes up. Why, you know, especially from our Christian point of view today, Jesus is sinless, so he has no need to repent. Jesus is greater than John, so why should he submit to John baptizing him? Why should the, the greater submit to the less? There's a couple of, um, couple of answers we found in, in um, the book here, in the commentaries. One is, remember that Jesus in, in Matthew's Gospel is there to fulfill the law. And, and Jesus says, in, you know, his response to John, why, why, should you be, why should I baptize you? I should be baptized by you. Jesus' answer is, do this to fulfill all righteousness. Now, righteousness is the right relationship with God. It's not simply doing, doing right, but by doing right, we are in right relationship with God. So, remember that Jesus is there 
to bring us into right relationship with God. And Matthew continually mentions that Jesus is doing these things or these things are being done to fulfill the scripture. So he's fulfilling the scripture, fulfill all righteousness, fulfilling the scripture and at the same time putting himself and us in right relationship with God. The other is, if you notice, Jesus is replicating the history of Israel. So, as, as we heard earlier, just as the, the um, exile into Egypt, when Jesus and Joseph and Mary fled into Egypt, and then they returned, Matthew quotes the scripture, out of Egypt I have called my son. And then, after this, after his baptism, he's going to go into the desert, so that again, he spends, the, he spends 40 days in the desert, the Israelites spend 40 years. So he's, he's replicating, not, not repeating in its entirety, but replicating the major passages of Israel's history, which is an important aspect to this. So he's affirming the demands of the covenant. The other is that, you know, as they start this conversation, Jesus goes in, he gets baptized, and then we hear God's voice. And again, in Matthew's Gospel, the, the, the voice is different, not what is said, but the, the voice is different than, the, um, than it is in, in uh, Mark and Luke. Uh, the voice is heard by everyone. And this voice is acting in, in counterpoint to John. So remember, John's voice was, I don't understand this, why should this be done? God's voice says, this is my beloved son. Everybody hears that. Not, it's not like thunder, which John describes it. It's the, not Matthew and Mark where only Jesus hears it. But everybody hears this voice. This is my beloved son. And the beloved son can hint at three different images. The beloved son is the chosen servant from Isaiah. Um, or it is a it is uh, or, it, or a child who will save. The second thing is the beloved son is son of the Davidic line, a king of Israel. So all of all of the kings were considered the sons of God because David was God's son. Is, is that's one of the images God used with David. And then also Israel itself, the nation itself, is God's firstborn son. So all three of those. Uh, are ways of interpreting that this is my beloved son. And as it mentions, a voice from heaven is ringing the heavens. And in kind of the Jewish mythology, or, or uh, it's not mythology, it's, it's um, in the Jewish in the Jewish universe, the three natures, uh, the underworld and uh, the world we live in and the heavens, were all separated. They all kept separate. But when the voice rends the heavens, it opens up the heavens, we have direct access to God. It's almost like scenes from those movies where, you know, like the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where all of a sudden the ark is open and the thing goes up and the heavens are rent and then the power of God comes out and, and destroys everybody of, of unfaithful heart. Um, it's, that, it's that sense, but in, in Jewish understanding of the universe, the, the worlds are kind of, are, are definitely separated from each other. You know, and, and God places his, his bow in the sky. There is the firmament above and there's the firmament below. And, and with the land we are on, the, the world we live in, is in this plane only. And in order to separate us from the waters above, there, God, God has to have his bow over it to keep the waters from falling down. Because it, it keeps the world separate. Well, he rents the heavens. He rents that thing so we have direct access to God at this moment. So we have direct contact with the divine. So Jesus said to him, reply, allow it for now, thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And he allowed him, after Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and the proper translation of that word would be, were rent, the heavens were, were rent, and, the, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. So because the heavens are open, the Spirit of God can descend directly upon him. And a voice came out from the heavens, saying, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> then we get into chapter 4. And we move to the temptations of Jesus. So, right after the baptism, then Jesus was led by the Spirit. So the Spirit who came down, then takes him into the desert. To be tempted by the devil. Now, 
we always see this as the 40 days that he's in the desert and these temptations. And most probably there are other temptations. And, you know, but, but these three are recorded. And they're recorded by the, the, uh, the three gospel writers, the three the synoptic writers, in order to help us understand their kind of the, the, the themes of the temptation. Were there others that they come over in those 40 days? One writer suggests that maybe these are a lifetime's worth of temptations just being gathered up into one moment in the Gospel. Again, the Gospels are literary devices that, that are meant to you know, explain these things. So they're, they're explaining the reality of what happened to us, but they're not necessarily explaining, to them, explaining us to them in a historical timeline. So their timeline is not history. Or, or, or time, their timeline is to be able to help us understand what is going on and what these things mean. So we have the temptation. Jesus goes out in the desert and echoes the journey through the desert after the Exodus. It's the 40 days instead of 40 years. Now remember, the first three chapters, we consistently heard that Jesus is the Son of God. Until finally at the end of chapter 3, God's voice himself says, this is my beloved Son. So... We, we got him in chapter 1, we got him in chapter 2, now in chapter 3, this is the Son of God, so we know that. Now we're going to, be, from those three chapters of this is my Son, now we're going to come up with three basic doubts, three fundamental doubts. And again, whether or not this, these doubts were a lifetime's worth of doubts collected into, into one spot, in one moment in the Gospel, or they happen in one moment, or these were the only three or not, not important. They all begin with, if you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God, if this is true, then, then you should do this. So if this is true, so there's that doubt whether or not this is actually true, and then of course the doubt whether or not he will be the Son of God, because the Son of God would do what is all righteousness. So if he can pull him away from doing that which is correct, you know, not only has he conquered him, but he's also destroyed this whole theory that he's the Son of God. So if you are the Son of God, gratify your own desires. Gratify your own hungers. Do something for yourself. Take care of yourself. Turn these stones into bread. If you are the Son of God, care about yourself not about the people you came for. Because, you know, you're worth it. Take care of yourself. If you get a day off, <laughs> take it. Okay? Now, thankfully, none of, none of the priests have to be the Son of God, so we can take a day off. <laughs> there was no union for six days. So. <laughs> but it's, it's that... Do you gratify your own desires? Do you look after your own hungers? Or are you going to take care of someone, someone else? Second, if you are the Son of God, make people believe in you. Okay? Turn, uh, compel them to believe in you. Show your power. So the first one is turn the stones into bread. And of course, Jesus responds, one does not live by bread alone. And the second one is... Then the devil said, take him to the parapet of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Because when you, when you don't die, they will believe in you. Show your power. Do something to make them believe in you. And, and again, Jesus responds with, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And the third, the third temptation if you are the Son of God, misuse your power. Misuse your power in an idolatrous way. Turn away from God. Because if you are the Son of God, you would be equal to God, and therefore you can do as you wish. You do not have to follow after Him. You are on your own. You can do as you like. So the Lord, um, so and he says, um, so he shows them all the, the kingdoms, and he says, all these I will give to you if you prostrate yourself and worship me. Now, the word prostrate is used three times. Remember, the Magi prostrated themselves before the baby. 
And then, of course, the women at the tomb, when uh, they prostrate themselves at the resurrection, when they, when they encounter the Lord. So this, this action, falling down on your face in, in, in adoration and worship, is, is meant only for God. And the Magi recognize Jesus as God. The disciples and women resurrection recognize Jesus as God. Will Jesus recognize someone else as God? Will he prostrate himself before Satan? And of course, he refuses to do that. And he, he uses the same line he uses one other time in the Gospel. Get behind me, or get away from me, Satan. Which he says, of course, to Peter. When Peter doesn't want him to die... He says, get behind me, Satan. So he uses the same line here. Well, of course, he's talking to Satan here. But he uses that same line later to Peter. Because he sees that as another temptation. As another misuse of power. Particularly for, for that would be idolatrous for Jesus to give up the cross in order to uh, save himself. When Jesus comes back... Um, John is arrested. So he hears that John is arrested, and Jesus then um, withdraws to Galilee. I'm going to pull the map here. So, this is Nazareth over here. This is the Sea of Galilee. And of course, the Mediterranean Sea is way over here. So Nazareth is not right on top of the Sea of Galilee, but it's, it's in the general region. Now, this area here, and <laughs> this re region up here is, is today is Syria. It, well, in those days it was Syria as well. The Golan Heights are here. So they overlook the Sea of Galilee. And, and if you're at the Sea of Galilee on the eastern edge, the shore rises up dramatically. And that's the Golan Heights. And when we talk about the storm, when, the, when Jesus walks in water, we talk about the storm coming up. Um, or Jesus in the boat and, and the storm comes up suddenly. It's because the wind comes in off the Mediterranean, it's a strong wind, it hits the Golan Heights and comes and circles back around and causes turbulence in the sea. So, so the wind hits up against the mountain and comes back this way and creates this kind of tunnel over the Sea of Galilee, which creates these heavy storms that, that is recorded in the Gospel. So, so what's happening here is, um, and of course further down, which the, this map doesn't go further down, Jerusalem is down here, the Dead Sea's down here. Bethlehem's down this way also. So, of course, Jesus is born down here. They moved up to Nazareth, where he lived for many years with his family. And um, presumably he lived until after he was baptized. He, he went over here to be baptized. Probably up this way, right around here. And then after, after John is arrested, he goes up to Capernaum. This area down here was all part of Herod's territory. So this is this is really Israel in a sense. What we would what we think of as Israel. This up here is is more Roman territory. There's a highway that goes to uh, Damascus that runs this way from the sea and runs along the north end of the Sea of Galilee. So there's basically a, a Roman road coming up this way that that goes back all the way up into Damascus and Syria. So. Basically, what Jesus can do, by going to Capernaum, what he does is, and again, for those of you who like conspiracy theories, um, look at it, Jesus as uh, being politically astute. So, at this point though, here, he can hide from Herod when he needs to. He can preach in here, which is, this is Jewish territory, but it's not controlled by Herod. Uh, he can preach in here, but if they get mad at him, he can go over here, where, which is uh, Roman territory, or Syrian territory, and then again, they can't touch him because he's in another state or another province. So he can go back and forth between the various provinces because they all kind of line up here at the sea. Um, and, and of course, by being at Capernaum, which is a sea town, he can, he can travel by boat elsewhere. So this allows him quick escape when he's in trouble. So you notice the number of times he, he gives a discourse and he gets a few people upset with him and then he's on his way somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because he's running. <laughs> kind of like Bonnie and Clyde. Well, not necessarily like Bonnie and Clyde, but running from his enemies. He didn't have a B-84, huh? So, and so the, the question was whether or not Bethsaida was 
actually Bethsaida, that, well, that's a question on this map, but um, this area right around Capernaum, um, many of the miracles and many of the, the things that we, uh, some of our best little stories about Jesus all happen right there. So there's a, there's a kind of a mountain up here that forms this wonderful natural amphitheater that, um, so from the, from the mountain that it just kind of slopes nicely down into the sea. So if you're at the low end and people are seated on, seated on the grassy area, because it's not a, it's not a tall mountain, it's just kind of a grassy area, you could talk to them and thousands could sit there and it'd be like an amphitheater and they, they would hear you because it has a natural echo. That's the Sermon on the Mount. And that's where that took place. The um, um, Peter's Confession of Faith, where they're at the shore, they're up at Capernaum, there's a rocky area, and um, that's probably where Jesus had breakfast. The um, uh, Chapel of Tatka, uh, the multiplication of loaves and fishes, also happened in this area. There's a Roman synagogue in Tatka, a Roman temple, oh, there's a synagogue from Roman times in, in Capernaum, there's a Roman temple, and of course they, they excavated like uh, Peter's house and all of that up there. So um, that's that's where Jesus headed to. It gives him easy access or easy egress from wherever he is back around. And, and of course you hear about him going to Tiberias and Bethsaida, and he talks about Chorazin in the Gospel, and so you see all those places are there. Mount Tabor is the place where the, uh, uh, the uh, Transfiguration happened, um, which is kind of in the middle of this plain. And um, so you see, it, it kind of they all start falling into place. And this would have happened on the way down to Jerusalem, which is down at the other end of the Jordan River. So Jesus moves up to Capernaum because he, he faces danger on a regular uh, level. But also there's a larger audience happening because it, it is where Syria, and it's close enough to Phoenicia uh, or Lebanon, and um, as well as the, the population up there. Because it's a trading route, there's more people living up there. So there's a larger audience. And again, his message is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And now when in Christ we see this kingdom in a couple of ways. First, the call of the disciples so as he starts this message, he calls his disciples then. So you have that, his, his heaven is at hand. And then you have the call of the first disciples. And he's walking along the Sea of Galilee, up by Capernaum. And he calls out to Simon and, and, uh, and um, his brother Andrew. And he says, and they're fishermen, they're mending their nets. And he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So the kingdom is called, the call of the disciples is to become something more. Something more than they are now. So this is what you're doing now, but I can I can get you to do this. And remember that the, the mission that Christ calls him to is, is not simply to follow him. It's follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It's to, it's to be, it's an active mission. So we're not simply followers of Jesus like we sit and Jesus shows us the way. He's running the, you know, he's he's leading the chariot and we're just all seated in the in the coach. We're supposed to be doing something. It's an active mission. I will make you fishers of men. You're still going to be working. You're still going to be fishing. But you're going to be fishing for something more. Something greater. And of course he does the same thing. And it looks, when you, when you go through um, um, the second call, which is to the sons of Zebedee. But really it looks like the call is to Zebedee first. So it, it says, um, he goes along. And he two, I saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. He called them. And at first you think, well, okay, is he calling the whole family? Is he just calling uh, Zebedee? Or is he calling the sons? He called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father to follow him. So one leaves behind their, their business, the other leaves behind business and family. So again, the call is, it's a, it's a greater call. So as, as he goes on, people are willing to sacrifice more to know him. To get to, so there's, there's an increase going on. There's not just an increase of what's going to become of, of the disciples, but there's an increase of the sacrifice they're making in order to follow him. Then his fame spreads. His fame spreads throughout the region. He went around all of Galilee, so that whole Sea of Galilee area. Uh, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and curing every disease and illness among the people. 
is fame spread to all of Syria. So not just the Galilee, not just to the Jewish part, but to Syria as well. And they brought to him all who were sick with various diseases and wrecked with pain. Those who, were, those who were possessed lunatics and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan, followed him. So there's, there's this kingdom of heaven is now growing. His fame spread. So this repent the kingdom is at hand. Remember, John, John didn't go anywhere with it. He, he, he stayed there, and they were coming to him from everywhere in order to hear this message, in order to be baptized. But Jesus now is bringing the message everywhere. And it is growing. It's the same message, but now it is growing. And, and things are changing. Because now the sick are being cured. Now there are miracles happening. Now, now there's action going on, activity going on with the charisma. So it's not just a proclamation. It's not just repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. But now it is repent and watch your life change. Watch miracles happen. See what is going to become of you. And, and particularly, you know, they, they bring forth, and those who are sick are healed. So they are made new. There's a new kingdom. There's a new life. There's a new beginning. All because of this proclamation of the kingdom of God. Questions? Not at all. Great. No. <laughs> um, John is in prison right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <clears throat> is this the imprisonment that leads to his beheading? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do we hear from John again in Matthew's Gospel? I do not believe so. Mm -hmm. we, hear, we hear of him again in, in Mark's Gospel, but after the imprisonment, and we hear the story of the of the murder of John, the murder of John. Mm -hmm. John, um, no, he does come back. He actually he sends disciples over to Jesus and asks them um, what's happening. And, and Jesus says, "Go back and tell John what you what you see and hear." Okay. It's it's the Pharisees and Sadducees that were checking him out, right? That that led to his imprisonment. No. John, John had the um, unfortunate advantage, uh, dis unfortunate, um, uh, made the unfortunate mistake of um, talking about the king's wife. So, oh, be because, he, because he said it wasn't right for Herod to marry Herodias, who was really his, his brother's wife before. Mm -hmm. And remember, again, Sunday's Gospel, if, you're, if your brother dies leaving a wife childless, you're to marry him. Right. <laughs> well, the, Herodias wasn't childless, so... John had, or Herod had no right to marry her. Mm -hmm. And therefore, by marrying her, he committed sin, and John challenged that sin, and that led to his imprisonment. Well, she ordered his head on Well, she, well, yes, because that, the whole story is that Her Herodias' daughter, who was not Herod's daughter, but Herodias' daughter from her previous husband, uh, did a dance for her new father on his birthday, which so pleased him, so delighted him, that he was willing to give her up to half his kingdom. And so she runs back as she's like 12 or 14 or something like that. And says, Mommy, what do I ask for? What do I ask for? And ask for the Baptist head on, on a platter, on a silver platter. And so I think the girl got the silver platter and Mom got the head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. He was still talking when it was, when it was on that's, the That's all just Christian mythology. That's, that's, those are just tales from the crypt. <laughs> As it were. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say, I had a youth group uh, in New Orleans, and I had a dance, and we did that play, and it was powerful, especially with the, the head coming in, being bloody. Yeah, we have their head. Is that how the English kind of follow up on all this, off of their head? Um, well, the... Power the I don't know exactly about how the English did it. The French made it into a sign. So. Well, but that was later. Yes. But that, was, that whole sense of, basically, the whole sense of beheading someone it is, again, kind of the, the worst thing you could do to them um, to the kill them. The killing quarter is the worst thing you can do. Well, no, separating the head from the body, basically, it is meant to keep the soul from going up into heaven. So it, it, it's, that's, that's the idea behind it. And, and you notice that, um, you know, Muslim extremists used it on one of their, they, they showed that execution. Um, that's all, that was always the most extreme execution was to, was to chop the head off. 
and you know the, the English, the French, any any king did it over a number of period, you know, over time in different places, uh, simply because that was always seen as the worst way of executing someone, or the worst thing you do to them is to remove their head, and therefore they can't get to heaven, uh, which isn't true, but. It's like, you know, the, the Santeria people who, who think that if you have a statue of a saint, you cut off their hands, the saint has no power. Well, the statue has no power to begin with, because the saint has no power, he's in heaven, or she's in heaven, and therefore, he, you can't do anything to the saint. So how did American Indians come along that too, when they, when they would disfigure soldiers right. on the battlefield? Exactly. It's not, it's not enough to kill them, you have to, you have to mutilate them on top of it. So they don't come back, actually. Yes. They got their eyes, chop off their hands. Any other questions? Anything less gruesome? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably. I, I just, you know, I look at the temptation of Christ. And I always ask myself why you have to go through that. I understand why. But why would God put them through that? I mean, why would He put all of us through that? Why test us? The temptation, or, or are you talking about the passion? No, the temptation. So why would God put us through temptation? Yeah. God doesn't I mean, put us through temptation. We're so, we're so fallible. I mean, why? Well, well, remember, first of all, temptation is the act of Satan, not the act of God. Exactly. So um, the fact that we're, you know, when, when we're baptized, we are anointed. The first time we're anointed, and we're, you're supposed to be anointed over the whole body, the, the head, the, the, the breast, and the hands and feet would be the normal thing, but, but for... For Friday's sake, or to clean things up, we just do the we do the head, the breast, and the hands. Now we don't have them dressed the baby entirely, but the idea behind the anointing, that first anointing, is to protect the child from temptation, um, to to avoid them, so that the protection of God it completely surrounds the child, completely covers them with that, that oil. But the the truth is, the the temptation or temptation is is the work of Satan, which basically is an attempt to draw us. Yes, we're fallible, but again, the question is whether or not we're going to be compelled to follow God. So to, to follow God and never be tempted means that we really don't know the strength of our faith. To, to be tempted and to either fail or succeed, or you know, to conquer the temptation, means that our faith grows stronger in either case. When we fail, it should bring us back to conversion and repentance again. Which, even though baptism is a one-time event, you know, conversion and God's forgiveness is not a one-time event. So the mercy of God is always present and available to us, which is not necessarily true. It's not always preached in all religions, and um, it wasn't necessarily true in their eyes. But from a Christian's point of view, when, if we fail in our temptation, you know, if we're tempted and we fail, we can always be forgiven, which is one of the basic messages of Christ, is that the mercy of God is always available to us. Therefore, to fail in temptation is, is not the end of things. Um, but because we convert, or because we repent of what our sin is, that should make us stronger in faith. So we, we come back to faith renewed and with a stronger understanding of what it means to be faithful. Now, sometimes we have to keep repeating that same sin until we, until we figure it out. But, you know, so there are the times that we... we we fail and we do the same thing over and over and we don't know why we get caught in that. But when we finally figure it out, we can put that sin behind us. At least, at least for that time until it tempts us in a new way, in a new understanding. And of course Satan is very tricky because what seems so easy to figure out, you know, when, when we say, okay, when I was 10 I did this and I, I didn't have to do that, I don't do that anymore. And then, you know, you're 30 and you think, that's really the same thing I did when I was 10, only only a, a little it's bit more subtle, yeah, yeah at, a, at a little bit different level. Well, it's be again because he's found a new way to to trick us into that. Um, so it, it's easy enough to follow follow that. But the, the the ability to to conquer temptation also strengthens our faith. So to know that when we are yes we are tempted and yet we continue to move forward, that that's a sign of a of, of an even surer faith. So, temptations that come to me that I can dispel, as, as soon as I recognize that these are merely temptations and I can dispel them, that strengthens me for the ongoing battle or for the ongoing ministry, whatever I must do. Um, and hopefully other people do the same with their lives and their temptations. So, you might be, you might be tempted to say, 
no, I'm, I'm doing this because this is the right thing to do. And that strengthens you for it. And if you read the lives of the saints, um, many of them who wrote biographies talk severely of temptations and sufferings that they underwent. Um, and yet, we see them, we see only their holiness because we see them at the end of the journey. And, and so, we see their holiness and we say, wow, that was great they were able to do that. When they're in the midst of it, they're not feeling so great. And they're certainly not feeling like saints at that moment. But that's how we get through. By perseverance, you will save your lives. So it's, it's that sense of perseverance. So if we are not tempted, and we simply, God makes the path smooth for us, then, then really we have nothing to tread. Uh, and, and we have nothing to gain. Well, if it was easy, everybody would do it. It's the heart that makes it great. Yes, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard, but it is available for everybody to do. So you mean to say Satan goes sneaking around inside his own little parallel kingdom of sin, trying to tempt people? I, what is I wouldn't call Satan's reign a, I, 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 well, I wouldn't call have, it. I wouldn't call it a reign or a kingdom. Doesn't he have his own kind of king that fights that, that fights God? No, that would that would give too much authority to Satan, or, or too much honor to Satan. No. Satan Satan is without a king, which is why he's fighting for him. Satan is without honor, which is why he he continues to, to scope around in the darkness of our lives. Um, yeah. So you you don't want to give Satan more than his due. His due is nothing. Um, so you don't want to give him any more than nothing. <laughs> Uh, the problem is we, we end up paying attention to him at times and, and then we give him more than he deserves. Uh, See, how about and and all that stuff? You know what? There's a whole other story. There was a very good <coughs> story of a minister's daughter that was playing with the Ouija board with her friends. There you go. And it finally gave her, oh, a very nice answer. She said, who are you? The answer was the Prince of Darkness, yeah. which means he's not the Prince of Light. He's the Prince of Darkness only. Right. That's why all the crimes and, and, you know, real bad sin usually is done under the cover of darkness. People would rather see that there'll be no light on what they're doing. But you and, notice he's not the King of Darkness. Yeah. It's, no, it's not a kingdom. Right. It's just that he calls himself, right. but he's always been a liar. So he puts himself in exalted position. I am the prince of darkness. Right. He's the prince of nothing. Right. Because Jesus' blood shed is enough to overpower him in a minute. Yeah, exactly. So that's all people have to do is say, Jesus, let me have a drop of your blood to prevent me from this, this evil that I'm tempted to. If they would call more on the name of the Lord and, and ask for the power that's given, Satan would have no power at all. Yeah, it's, a, it's that remembering to do that is the problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and, and that's, that's where we all fail. Yeah. Because we don't, we don't remember to do that often enough. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's... But if Satan doesn't have much power, he wouldn't be a worthy adversary, would he? He's not a worthy adversary. He's not worthy. Oh, no, no, no. if you're very tempted, you know, oh, no. you've got a lot to overcome. Well, no, you do have a lot to overcome, but he, but he again, he, he's not worthy. He's, he that is, might be the case. Okay, so but that's why, that's why good, I, I challenge fight, the adjectives. Uh, good fights evil, though, see? It's almost like an evil. No, no. no. Evil fights good. You take your pick. It's a fight anyways. Everybody gets slugged in the fight. Well, you ever been in a fight where you never got a blow on you? I like yeah. people's wobbly. He always <laughs> Actually, bounce back. When you start giving the other guy two for one, he'll, he'll kind of figure out the math and he'll stop the fight. <laughs> Actually, I yeah, have. But this is it. I'm sorry. I was quicker than the other guy. <laughs> you got two next to one? I know. I, I, I had him pinned before he knew it. Doesn't so. <laughs> the Apostles Paul talk about uh, the kingdom of the world is evil. Yeah. And evil doesn't that mean Satan behind it? So, evil is turning away from God. Not not all evil is Satan, because that would presume then that we have nothing to do ourselves. 
We can be evil or good. We have the choice. The temptation to do evil comes from Satan. But that doesn't, that, the evil that I do is mine. It's, it's not Satan's evil, it's my evil. So you can't say you the know, devil made me do it? You can't say the no, devil made me do it. The devil is the devil showed me how to do it. The devil, to to do it. The devil led me along the way, but I had to do it myself. But saying that the kingdom of the world is evil, right. it, it presumes a reign of the well, yeah, the, the, but it's not, we're not, it's not talking about Satan. It's talking about the world we live in. And so, again, in, in Paul's day, it would have been the emperor, and it would have been the, the corrupt system of government that was happening in the various provinces and the way that, that it was set up. In today's world, we might call it, you know, we might call it big business, or we might call it, you know, unjust laws, or we might call it just the, you know, the lack of, people willing to compromise in Congress or whatever you want to call it. But you know, there's there's a number of ways. But those those are all kingdoms of the world. And and that's not, you know, just because it's the kingdom of the world is not necessarily referring to Satan. It's referring to the world we live in. And the world we live in has a propensity toward uh, taking care of itself. That's that first temptation, taking care of itself. You know? And there's you know there's nothing wrong with having money, but how are you using the money? That's where it becomes wrong. Um, so if you're only using the money to satisfy yourself and you're not helping anybody else with it, then the money has become a problem to you. Um, so there's you know there's no problem with having money. It's what do you do with the money? There's no problem with having fame. It's what do you do with the fame? So you know you get uh, some people who are very famous and then they do all kinds of sickening things. You get other people who are, are very famous and they're very famous because of the good things they do. That's, you know, so that's the difference between, you know, there's the kingdom of the world, and then there's the, the kingdom of God, which are those who are, that usually because people say, I'm doing this because I see Christ, or because I, I feel this is the right thing to do to honor God, or whatever it might be, but they, they usually attribute their goodness to inspiration from, from their religious beliefs. You have a question? No? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, um, now we're going to skip when we get to for next week. So, so we're going to do two different chapters. Chapter 20. Yeah, we'll get to those. I will get back to those. Remember, this is this speaks about the kingdom of heaven, and then when we get to uh, February, we'll do it, another topic. We'll, we will do the entire Gospel of Matthew, but we're going to do it by themes and not by chapters. So the first one is chapter 20, the second one is chapter 25. 20 and 25. So again, it's just two chapters. So everybody got that? Chapter 20, chapter 25. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you know somebody, you don't need applause, but thank you. Um, if you know somebody who missed the class, we will get it uploaded. Uh, if not tonight, it will be uploaded by tomorrow. Um, so that way people can go onto the website.